This is the Change Fail Podcast with Kevin Brennan and Julian Sammy. Episode 5 on June 21st, 2016. I have mergers in my areas. Watch, listen, subscribe, and discuss at change.fail. No.com on the end, just change.fail. Hi, Kevin. How are you tonight? Hi, Julian. I'm good. And yeah, I think this is actually the first one of these we've done at night rather than during the day. It is indeed the first evening show. It's, uh, it means that we have to sort out some things about our lighting and, uh, and try to coordinate our, our clothing again, you know, because <laughs> I think red is just sexy. Um, and I, I think it's kind of, well, I'm not sure if it's ironic or appropriate that we're talking about mergers. And we're wearing the same colors. <clears throat> yeah, well, just think of it as a hostile takeover of your clothing. Oh, sweet God, no. <laughs> All right, so our topic tonight is mergers. I think no matter what you call them, uh, whether you're thinking in terms of uh, consolidation or takeovers or acquisitions or even acquires, they are disastrous, generally, or at very least, they fail about 80% of the time. I'm not going to argue with you about the uh, train wreck history of most mergers and acquisitions, because it's, a, it's pretty much a matter of public record, right? Most of the time, people do this, and they fail. But it's worth thinking about, why would it be an appealing approach? And for strategic reasons, it comes down to Companies are frequently under pressure to grow, either because of stock market expectations or owner expectations or whatever else it may be, executive compensation. And one of the easiest ways to grow quickly is to buy your way into another market by taking over a company that already is there, either one that's adjacent to you in terms of the space it's in or one that uses similar capabilities. And I think, in fact, that starts to get into the reasons, some, one of the reasons why a lot of these things fail. Do you really think that growth is the, the primary motivator for, for mergers? Uh, that's been my understanding from a lot of the reading I've done, yeah, is that it's, usually an, it's generally an attempt to create a bigger potential market for the company, right? Either you move into a new geographic area or you move into a new market area. The successful ones, I think, are the ones where you're more looking to acquire something that you don't have in-house, where you know that there's a capability that you that they have that you need. Okay, so I can agree with you on the last point. I think growth is a subset of that. Um, when you look at, say, Microsoft and LinkedIn, which you know just happened and, and which is the inspiration for this particular episode, I don't think either of them is really going to grow from this merger. Like, I think they're trying to stave off shrinkage, not necessarily to get significantly larger rapidly. Now, that would be different from, say, um, Time Warner and Comcast. Right. Like, that was a growth play. Yeah, or what happened in the beer industry uh, over the last several years, actually, such as the acquisition of, you know, the creation of Molson Coors on the one hand and InBev's acquisition of Anheuser-Busch, right? Right, so those are consolidations, which generally you would expect a larger chunk of market share, which is distinct, I think, from some of the, the kinds of mergers that we've been seeing where they've... They've done acquires, like they'll, they'll buy out a small company. Google has done this a ton. They're not buying the company for its product. They're buying it for the team, which they then integrate into their operations with varying degrees of success. Right. In fact, uh, I used to use this iOS uh, app called Sparrow, which is a great email client. And it that's exactly what happened to it. Google bought them out and shortly thereafter shut down the product itself. Because they were after the engineering talent that the company had, not the product itself. And I think that is a new trend in technology in particular, right? Most past acquisitions have been with the idea that, you know, not necessarily that you keep every product going, but, but you are really trying to acquire their customers or their market share 
or something like that. And so you have the companies had an incentive to keep it going. But in the aqua hire thing that's been coming more and more popular in Silicon Valley, especially the customers are irrelevant. The market share is irrelevant and the company could be doing reasonably well and still be a target for that sort of acquisition. I think we need to come back, or at least I'd like to come back to your original question, which was why are these things so likely to fail? You know, we talked about HP and Compaq, which was generally considered a disaster. You know, there's the whole AOL Time Warner saga, which ended up like a lot of these things creating net negative value. So in those cases, I think that there are a couple of issues that get at the core of why they failed. Um, there was a paper, it just goes back to 1998, and the research that was done basically came up with three reasons why they thought mergers showed up as failures about 80% of the time. The first was they thought that the, the existing research might be using measures of success that really didn't, that managers and executives and leaders, they were not measuring merger success based on how much the stock price went up. They were not measuring it based on shareholder value increases. There were other motivations for those people. They also thought that the existing research was probably just how to know wrong. The data that was that existed had been uh, intentionally manipulated, or the research be the the research programs just didn't have access to the right kind of information. And a third thing falling prey to the optimism bias. They didn't call it that then, but that managers were overly optimistic about what could happen and did not plan uh, with the understanding that they were going to be inevitably optimistic about what they could do. But I think there's a fourth thing that's shown up in the, in the time since then, which is clashes of corporate cultures. If you try to take two organizations like Daimler Chrysler and put them together with a German work ethic and ethos and an American unions against the managers confrontational ethos and then ask them to start building cars together or to use the same kinds of processes there's going to be serious serious difficulty and I think that runs its way through everything that the companies both do and how they do it. There are companies with a decent run of success at mergers and acquisitions. Um, one I'm familiar with is Cisco. Full disclosure, I did do some work with Cisco in the last year. Um, it had nothing to do with this. So, you know, what I'm talking about is what I've read in the press, not anything that I know from my own, my own work there. But what I understand is that Cisco does a number of things when seeking out acquisitions. One is that they make sure that the acquisition is considerably smaller than they are. And the reason for that is it leaves no question as to which culture is going to be dominant after the merger. It's going to be Cisco's. Right. But at the same time, they do look at the company's culture. and They go through a checklist of things that they have prepared from their experience that says, OK, is this likely to be a fit with the way we operate and the way our organization works? Not just technologically, but also, again, culturally as well. Are they close enough that we can effectively integrate this organization into our, into our business? So when they look at the potential acquisition, they're thinking about their culture coming out on top and it being clear that there's no other way that it's going to be. You will conform to, to what Cisco is. Now, does that mean they lose people? or they only retain the people that they want. I can't really speak for how Cisco handles it. I, you know, I don't know that, that, that level of detail, but my understanding in most mergers is that there is an expectation that you're going to lose some people. In a lot of these mergers, especially ones where the companies are very similar and operational, in their operational aspects, in fact, that's a big part of the goal of the merger is the idea that you can service the entire existing customer base with significantly less people. Right. Because there's the presumption that you can simply move in and service the acquired company's customers with what you have in place. Uh, rationalization of infrastructure. You see that with HP Compaq. Carly spent a lot more time focused on getting operations rationalized, laying off people 
and thinking about the way that the infrastructure worked together. The next guy spent almost all of his time working on the corporate culture. And they had lost a lot of talent, people fleeing what they saw as a sinking ship. Yeah, that, sound, that, well, that sounds like a high morale situation all around. So what is the motive that managers have to get into this in the first place? And I don't mean like for the company, I'm thinking about individual leaders. Why would they pursue what is, even if you're good at it, still a high-risk proposition? Well, I've heard a lot of comments on that. One is that, um, you know, for a senior executive, a merger or an acquisition, that's the kind of cool thing to be doing. You know, it's an interesting project. It's an exciting thing to do rather than just sort of sit around and grind out, you know, another 3 or 4% through continuous improvement of efficiencies. Let's go out and buy something. And then people will see what we're doing something. You know, it'll be a big challenge. It's something that looks good on my resume, I, you know. And all these things can come together to create a situation where they, you know, there's just that inbuilt motivation to go out and do something. And of course, you know, the fact that most of these fail... Well, that's not a problem because we're not most people. Back in that 1998 paper, which by the way is called, If Most Mergers Fail, Why Are They So Popular? One of the things that they talk about is personal motives um, for things like increased sales, but also managerial challenge and enhancing managerial prestige. So you have people who are personally motivated to want to take on a challenge. But when you couple that with a failure to appreciate how difficult these things are and fall into that optimism bias, then you set yourself up for failure. Even if you have everything lined up to be successful, you can snatch defeat from the claws of victory. Oh, I've seen that happen far too many times to rule it out. The question is then, what, would, what makes a successful merger? I mean, there are a number of examples out there of mergers that really did well for the companies in question. Uh, a good one that everybody cites is the Disney takeover of Pixar. So did they really merge? Well, they did something very interesting, actually. Uh, one of the big things that was a motivator behind that decision was that Disney felt its animation studios were lacking. They were declining over time. The quality and reception of movies was... If he's on, you know, they had some decent stuff coming out, but they weren't the money makers. Pixar was getting all the critical acclaim. You know, they had, at the time, they'd had an unbroken string of critically acclaimed hits. And so the goal for Disney in acquiring Pixar was actually to create a corporate culture change at Disney. And so when they bought out Pixar, what happened is that they moved over some of the key people at Pixar, like Ed Catmull, uh, they had John Lasseter, and they actually had them working part-time heading up Disney Animation Studios to revamp Disney into operating at the same level as Pixar. And in the years since then, you know, it didn't happen immediately, but we've seen things like Tangled and God Help Us, um, both of us being the parents of young daughters, Frozen. Which, to be fair, they knocked it out of the park on that one. A huge success, but... And the point is that they, they got the results they wanted, which is that, you know, Pixar is still successful. It still, ha yeah, it still has its own culture distinct from Disney Animation Studios, but they were able to pollinate enough of what made Pixar work into Disney Animation to make Disney Animation much stronger than it was as well. So that makes sense. I think one of the, the trends that I've seen across all the reading I've done is that many successful quote-unquote mergers, and this is why I asked, was it really a merger, um, can leave behind a real and functioning unit that still has its own distinct culture and history within the larger organizational structure, rather than trying to create one unit, uh, one animation unit in the case of Disney and Pixar. In the case of Microsoft and LinkedIn, I suspect that they're going to do very well because both companies care deeply about culture. Uh, Sachin Nadella has been very clear about his approach to, to dealing with corporate culture, his work at Microsoft over the last few years. 
in many ways is being focused on changing the culture of the organization to operate in the modern environment. And LinkedIn is a very, very strong corporate culture as well. Those cultures don't seem to be like obviously at odds on paper at least. And from what I've been able to read about employee reviews of those companies, uh, there seems to be enough common ground in their attitudes that they should be able to work together well enough to integrate the, the platforms and so on and provide a good customer experience. Right. Well, one of the things that the LinkedIn situation brings is that it, it brings Microsoft something they don't have, which is a social network. Right. It's not as if Microsoft has a strong presence in this space, a strong set of services in this space that's trying to integrate somehow with LinkedIn. Microsoft has nothing, really. And so that would tend to me to suggest that LinkedIn will probably continue more or less independently, as, as they've said, but that they're looking for LinkedIn to bring some social capabilities back into Microsoft's productivity solutions. Yeah, because Microsoft has made oh, at least three or four attempts at creating that social dynamic within like the office and productivity suites, things like links and, um, well, they bought Skype for a reason. And, you know, they've, they've done this a few times and it's never gained traction with, with anybody, really. Yeah, I think so as well. I mean, the one that had occurred to me was the opportunity for, um, particularly in the evolving gig economy, right, that there's a real play to be made for owning a social network that has business connotations that, you know, with the right identity structures in place, with knowing actually who people are, if those people are then subscribed to Office 365 or other things, you may simply be able to flip a switch and integrate a new person into your work environment, which I think has a big opportunity. The other one, which I saw pointed out today uh, by a tech commenter named James Allworth, is that there's also a big benefit to customers of things like Microsoft Dynamics, which is a CRM that is used by salespeople. And with LinkedIn, you've got some almost the holy grail of sales, which is a self-updating org chart of your potential clients. Yeah. Yeah, right? that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Because they, Microsoft um, has some, I mean, they've been playing nice with Salesforce, but there's some, there's some sweet buy out there that I have. I'm sure Microsoft wants a slice of, or a bigger slice of. So let me play futurist and, and run a scenario past you, because I'm curious what you think about this little bit of uh, prognostication. I don't know, let's call it 2025. Virtual reality and augmented reality headsets are not bulky, they're easy to use, and they're ubiquitous. They cost less than monitors, so everybody's got them. So your work environment is no longer limited to a screen in front of you. You have your documents in space around you in a virtual environment. It recognizes where your hands are. You can see physical people around you. You can sit down at your little desk. You can work in this big virtual space. Microsoft Office knows what you're working on. It goes to LinkedIn or draws your LinkedIn's social graph and pulls articles, expertise, ideas, and advice, and just puts them off to the side. So when I turn my head to, to look at my virtual bookshelf, there are things like how to deal with legal ramifications of, you know, HR policies in Nebraska, because I'm doing a requirements document that, you know, is relevant to that. And when I start going through that to get some advice, I see somebody who I think may be able to help me out because LinkedIn surfaces their expertise based on their social graph and their work experience. So I tap that person and say, hey, can we chat? And now a window opens up and we step into a virtual conference room and we can talk about what I'm doing. I get what I need on demand advice from a not employee who we have no particular other relationship. And I 
do my job better, faster, and inexpensively, rather than spending hours searching around or trolling boards to, to try to find my answers. It's like I'm seeing an opportunity for a virtual office space that extends not just to your team, but which, as you say, extends the concept of team. Shoot that down. <laughs> well, I can't, because that's kind of where I think some of this is potentially going, honestly. Um, at least in vision, right? But I think that that's what, so, that is something that only a very few companies have the power to pull off because they have a sufficiently large social graph. And LinkedIn that didn't, until yesterday, they didn't have the the infrastructure capability to do it, but they had the social st structure to do it. They had the information about all these people to do it. And now if you start connecting that into Microsoft's productivity backend, yeah, you actually have a platform that can really do that. Microsoft is today way, way ahead of any other competitor in that. And yes, there's going to be a, you know, a period of time that it's going to take them to integrate Facebook, sorry, LinkedIn into what it does. It's not going to happen overnight, but a few, a couple of years from now, I could see a lot of social tools being aggregated together into Office 365, which is clearly where Microsoft wants to go with its productivity side anyway. With Microsoft and LinkedIn integrating the, the workplace and the work life and the career together, they may be creating a, a position that is so dominant in terms of people's professional lives that no one will be able to compete. And not even like the long play that Google has, has taken with the education market where, you know, you have millions and millions of kids who have, are literally growing up on Chromebooks and using Chrome as their, their, uh, their operating system. I, I don't think that that's going to last. Like, I don't think that's going to be able to, to win against the, the stuff that Microsoft has just done but with this purchase. Yeah. I mean, I'm bullish on this particular merger. I don't think we're going to see something like the, you know, the Daimler Chrysler or the Time Warner um, Comcast friction that comes from, you know, having gears at different ratios and, and goals and attitudes that are radically different. So, you know, you ask, what can you do to be successful? Focus on culture, I think, is probably job one. Yeah, focus on culture. I think the second thing is um, <clears throat> a lot of successful acquisitions and mergers come from looking to add new talent and new capabilities to your organization that uh, mesh well with what you already have, but fill gaps that you have in the marketplace rather than, you know, whereas a lot of the failures we've talked about are ones where... The idea was that, you know, you're just getting into a new market and all you have to do is buy out this company and you can realize a huge cost savings because that cost savings often doesn't materialize for years, if ever, as you go through the painful process of downsizing. And, you know, similar to the old comment about you made about buying, you know, SAP, a company that does a merger for growth and acquisition to a new market is going to lose years to eating the acquisition in which, during which they won't be doing anything about growing in their new market. Yeah, from what I've read, the evidence says that if you're expecting to get your stock price up and your sales and, and revenues up, don't. You should expect there was three or four years at minimum before you're actually starting to compete and get any kind of revenue growth again because there is so much effort involved in that digesting, that, that integration of the two organizations. While you're busy doing all of that, your people are not looking at, you know, your competitors who are out there jumping up to all those dissatisfied customers. There is one last thought I want to throw out there, and that is the AOL Time Warner merger. Because that's often cited as one of the huge failures of mergers. And I've always wanted to say that I think there's a bit of a misread there. And the misread is that if you are Steve Case or another AOL shareholder, it was a brilliant decision. 
because they they were incredibly overvalued at the height of the stock com boom, and they made what I suspect is the best decision they could have made based on that stock overvaluation, which was to go and take over something that had lasting value. That had lasting value. So I can't disagree, although I really feel like I want to. <laughs> um, well, it was a failure on many other measures. I'm just saying on that one, yeah. there they had a good reason to do what they did. And I think they did the best they, thing they possibly could have for themselves. Whether or not that was a good thing for Time Warner. The analysis that I have read really doesn't touch on that idea that the the merger was a very good way to make use of free money essentially i don't i don't get the feeling that they anticipated that broadband would completely upset their business model i don't get the sense either that they had a any idea how vulnerable their business model was to changes going on in the internet I do think they had a sense that they their stock was overvalued and they wanted to get something out of it while they could. I think that's fair. Most mergers, 80% of mergers, are not really worthwhile. And the ones that are tend to do so for very specific reasons that your company may not have applied to it. I don't think there's a huge number of people at LinkedIn who are necessarily fearing for their jobs right now. Because they do something that's very different from what a, lot, what a lot of people at Microsoft do today. Not to say that there isn't any risk, but it's probably far less than at your typical merger. Thanks, Kevin. I learned some things. Our emails are kevin at change.fail and julian at change.fail. On Twitter, we're at BA Kevin, at CyBA, S C I underscore BA, and at ChangeFail, C H G F A I L. And you can find us at Facebook.com slash ChangeFail. Watch, listen, subscribe, and discuss Change Failures at Change.Fail.